Happy Saturday, everybody. Welcome, welcome uh, to a weekend edition of the CP Solvers VMR. Uh, you may be figuring out why we don't have a pattern on Saturday. We are pretty regular with everything except our chaotic Saturdays. And most of the time we do a Academy VMR where the Academy members uh, hang out and discuss cases. But um, this Saturday, we couldn't resist the uh, pleasure of uh, welcoming back our beloved Yuki from Japan, who has presented case after case after case and is here again um, presenting another case. And in the discussant, in the co-discussant seat is the one and only Dr. Jasdeep Bajwa, um, who uh, last time we co-discussed together what felt like a long, long time ago. And as an update for you all, his CP solver's identity has changed dramatically. Uh, he is now one of the... Uh, leaders of VMR. He is also a um, the uh, leader of the, uh, the uh, student VMRs on Sunday. And um, there's another surprise waiting for you all about um, Dr. Bajwa's role in the CP solvers. The only thing I can say publicly is it also begins with an S um, like Sunday VMR, but I'll leave it at that um, for now for you all to enjoy the surprise that will come in the future. But it's a really, really exciting day for me to hang out uh, with Yuki again and with Jas again. I'm really, really excited. So I'll hand the mic over to Jas and then Yuki to say hello, and then we'll jump right in as per usual. Honestly, I don't even know what the surprise is. <laughs> um, uh -oh. I don't know where it is, Jazz. <laughs> uh, um, I'm uh, honored again to discuss, uh, uh, co-discuss with Robbie today. Um, and Robbie's summary basically sum summarized uh, my role here, and I'm very grateful for, for the second family that I have here. Yuki, I'm very excited to uh, hear your case. I believe you're the same person that uh, presented that Klebsiella pneumonia case, and if that's the case, I am very nervous because uh, we're going to have a great case to dissect and learn from, but I have a feeling it's going to be difficult too. Thank you for remembering my previous case. Uh, I hope this case is not so difficult, but I'm not sure. But I'm also really excited to present today's case. You could you want to tell yourself uh, to tell some uh, something about yourself because uh, for those who haven't met you before. Okay, uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Yuki, and uh, I'm the general internal medicine physician in Japan. I'm, uh, yeah, I am the medical graduate, and now I'm working in the countryside of Japan. And uh, yeah, and uh, recently I'm wondering, uh, going to, applying to the next cycle, and uh, yeah, and my hobby includes watching baseball games. I'm not sure uh, any of you guys are uh, big baseball fan of fan or not, but I'm a really big fan of Shohei Otani. He, is, uh, uh, he, go, he will go to uh, uh, Dodgers. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Yuki, can I quickly interrupt and say that I'm a Blue Jays fan, and I was so sad when Shea Otani was supposed to come to Toronto and then pick the Dodgers. I, I, we were very sad. I had to interrupt and, and put that in there. Yeah, he's a yeah, really great player, isn't it? Yeah, I can really, I totally, I can totally relate it to you. I have nothing to add to your baseball drama. I have a lot to catch up for sure. Um, so I will awkwardly sit here and reflect with you all. Um, very, very excited for your case, uh, uh, Yuki. And thank you, Shreyas, for scribing in the middle of the night in India and for Mariana for making it to teaching points in the middle of your, your husband's work day. We're very, very excited. All right, Yuki, take it away. Okay. Uh, first, uh, today's case, chief complaint was Progressive shortness of breath and right wrist pain. Uh, HPI, 82 year old man presented to the hospital due to two month health of shortness of breath and right wrist pain. 
for Mars player, he experienced worsening of the dyspnea, and his inhaler lesion was changed with a relief. On the day of admission, he explained his right wrist for obtaining an outpatient service visit. The review of the system was positive for dry cough, dyspnea, anorexia, a right wrist swelling and redness. The labial cell stem was negative for headache, the throat, chest pain, and cells, heartburn, abdominal pain, as a vomiting, diarrhea, hematocardia, melina, skin rash, muscle weakness, tingling sensation, edema. Unfortunately, a detailed history, including morning stiffness, was difficult to take from that patient due to the dementia. I will stop here. Thank you, Yuki. Intriguing as always. Jess, I think that the temptation is to start to solve this problem, but I think a lot of people can benefit from your think from your um, analysis on where you would begin. So if, if you were seeing this person in real life, what do you think your mind would be focusing on? Because I think we got two different dimensions. There's something going on here and then something here. Um, how would you start to begin to take this on, you think? Yeah, I, I, clearly this like aliquot was pretty rich with a lot yeah. of information. Um, and, and I think in real life, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, it would be a little bit overwhelming to try to tackle it all, all of a sudden. So obviously the chief complaint is progressive shortness of breath. That's why they came in to see a physician, whether it's in the clinic or it's in the uh, ED or hospitalized setting. So I'd want to get more history on that. Is it, is it exerted? Is it on exertion or is it at rest? Because if it's at rest, that's even more concerning. However, the time course gives me some time to think. I feel like if it's two months and progressive, Sure, uh, it, it could have become an acute situation now, but it seems like it, this has been going on in a subacute time course. Um, but to be honest, things that stick out for me in this initial aliqua is the anorexia. Now that could be secondary to, let's just say hypothetically, really bad COPD or heart failure and the patient's becoming anorexic from that. But the, given the patient's age, I feel like malignancy is something that I would also be concerned about uh, in this situation. And I don't know if this is signal or noise right now, but I really feel that right wrist swelling and redness is weird. Um, I just feel like there's a disconnect um, between the progressive shortness of breath um, and then the right wrist uh, swelling and redness. I'm not going to talk too much about it just because it might just be two things unrelated to each other. But one thing that I can connect the dots with is an infection. Um, so an infection that may have um, started uh, in, in, in that area and kind of progressed in a systemic fashion. And the progressive shortness of breath is due to sepsis or a systemic uh, imprint from that infection. So that's where I am right now. Um, I have to basically, would, in this case, I would basically be sitting down with the patient and getting more history so I can kind of see which specific things to anchor on. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you, Jess. I think it's really, really tricky to um, realize where you would be investing your energy with hearing these words. And I think that, um, I think it's interesting that the chief concern is progressive shortness of breath. But if you um, zoom in on the details of that sequence of events, it seems that the patient has been tolerating the shortness of breath and the risk was so bad that that pushed him over the edge to come in. So it's hard to say. Uh, and, you know, the, the modifiers that were used about the wrist were that it was sprained and therefore um, uh, setting up the sense that it is true, true, and unrelated. And of course, when somebody has had a progressive cardiopulmonary issue, it's very easy to imagine that they have um, uh, either presyncope or syncope, and they have a mechanical musculoskeletal issue. But it's hard to imagine that that comes with prominent redness. And if you then just sort of reflect on what the redness would do for you here, it goes to show you that what would probably be happening in real life is you would be either actively or passively getting data from your eyes rather than your ears. And I think your eyes are gonna help you way more than your ears. So for example, if you used your eyes to see this, there's no way you think about the shortness of breath, the, the uh, wrist pain if somebody sitting in front of you is telling you my wrist, hurts a lot. You know, you're like going to be completely focused on that. But if you see somebody who's sitting there like calm, relaxed, 
and you see that their wrist is they're holding their wrist rigidly and the wrist is massively red so i got to tell you i think in medical school we learn to be systematic and to um have things in order but I think your mind would probably be making much more progress by using your physical exam observation skills. And I think it's so key to establish how much respiratory support that this person need right now, which you would probably see right away. And then because we're very good at that, I think it's going to be really, really important to be like, what is the probability that this person has a fracture or septic arthritis? And to know that not one hour into evaluating this patient, but right away, which will mean how quickly do I get an x-ray and how quickly do I proceed to getting an arthrocentesis of that wrist to um, gauge the, the, the need for um, those sort of advanced tests. I know that um, as a family medicine trained um, person, you have a lot more training than the average internist does in MSK issues. So I'm curious, like what tips can you give us from your experience to um, to um, understand the wrist pain a little bit better? What do you think? Yeah, putting me on the spot like always. Um, even, uh, I am telling about some train. My but friend, like you, 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 the, the spot goes to you gravitationally. I don't, I don't put it on there. It magnetically is drawn to you. <laughs> um, honestly, uh, it's been a while since I've been in the clinical setting. I miss it, to be honest with you. But um, when it comes to joint pain, uh, at least what I was trained is you want to look at, you know, is this, you know, um, it's an anatomical approach. Is this all skin subcutaneous tissue? Is this a ligament or um a, a tendon issue is this a bursa issue is this a tendon uh, uh, uh sorry an arthropathy versus arthritis so um basically um arthritis could be you know infection uh crystalline uh, arthropathy osteoarthritis blood autoimmune whereas arthropathy is basically it's similar to like myositis versus myalgia uh where it you know myalgia is just a sensation of you know, um, aches and pains, but there's really no true, um, like inflammation going on in that area, like a myositis or arthritis would be. So that's like my basic approach. Um, obviously I would want to do certain like wrist exams. Uh, I don't know where exactly this right, uh, uh, right wrist swelling and redness is, but if there's like over the thumb line, I would do certain, um, wrist-based, uh, exams, uh, to see if this, if it's more towards the thumb, is it through the thenar eminence, is it through the volar surface or dor dorsal surface? So those are the things I'm, I'm roughly thinking about. I think that's such excellent teaching. I agree with you. I think in real life, the next steps would be understanding the severity of these issues. Is there hypoxemia? Is there tachypnea? Is there increased work of breathing? And separately, is there risk uh, is there wrist, marked wrist edema or erythema to suggest fracture or septic arthritis? I think you need those two data points before you proceed. Of course, in this case, we're doing an artificial diagnostic exercise, but I think in real life, you want to know how bad are those problems well before you understand the nuances of whether they're exertional or non-exertional or whatnot. So um, I'm glad we got both the theoretical and the practical uh, out in this aliquot, and I'm excited for what Yuki has in store for us next. Okay, uh, next adequate has a past medical history, included COPD, Lewy body dementia, and hypertension. He was a Lancer Pulitzer, almost southern, for motilol, bodyplug acid, and respiratory. He denied no known allergies. Uh, he did not have no known allergies. Uh, in terms of social history, he has been retired lived in the nursing home, um, did not keep in touch with his family. Um, he was a past, man, past smoker and past drinker with a no frequency. No pets, no houseplants, no history of recent travel, no recreational drug use, or no occupational inhalation. Uh, physical exam, he was one meter, 60 centimeter tall, he was about 50 kilograms, so BMI, BMI around 20. 
body temperature was 97.3 Fahrenheit, heart rate 90 beats per minute regular, blood pressure 57 over 94, oxygen saturation was 96 on room air, he was awake and alert, an HND exam showed no conjunctive power, no hemorrhage, or no extras, three other things without accident. Neck exam showed no jugular valve distension, support neck. Uh, cardio cardiac exam showed regular atrial rhythm, no murmur. Pulmonary exam showed clear to auscultation bilaterally, no wheels, lungi, crackers. Abdominal exam showed both sounds pleasant, soft and flat, no tender, no just tender. In terms of extremities and skin, uh, no lashes or no edema, but his right wrist was uh, had swelling and redness like this earlier. I, okay, and I will continue. Just a liquid. Uh, Here's level the data. CBC showed white blood cell count 13K, whereas 70% of segmented neutral fields and 1.0% of eosinophils. fields. Hemoglobin 13.5, platelet 27.9K, LFT, ASD 21, ALD 19. LDH 214, live it elevated, ALB 85, CPT 33, albumin 3.4, slightly lowered, and BNP showed sodium 14.2, calcium 44.5, chloride 99, BUN 15, Creatine 0.665, glucose 160, correct the calcium 0.9.0, and CLB was 5. It is a little bit elevated because Japanese uh, normal range of CLB is under 0.4. I'll stop here. Hey, Yuki, this is absolutely amazing. I um, I love how deliberate you are about what you're going to present when, and I appreciate you giving us all this information. Um, Jazz, just for practice, I think, um, because I, I know the case is obviously a lot of data heavy, I'd love to, to sort of gauge your thoughts on when you hear COPD, how does that, in, in the moment, influence your thinking about what the possibilities are for a patient who's coming in with shortness of breath? What crosses your mind? Yeah, I think the first and foremost is uh, when I see the word COPD, the first thing I try to do is look to, look to see if there's a uh, pulmonary function test. Um, I think that's, in, especially in the hospitalized setting, we see COPD a lot of the times. And it most, I would say a good portion, a good chunk of that time, we uh, we don't have an accurate diagnosis. And it could sometimes be um, something else. And it can sometimes you, you're treating the wrong thing or um, or suboptimally at least. That's the first thing. Second thing I think of is, you know, triggers. Um, you know, uh, what triggers do uh, this, was there any recent trigger? And the third thing is gold criteria. Um, do they actually meet the criteria of COPD with the increased mucus production, cough and shortness of breath? Um, and then I think about things that basically can masquerade as a COPD exacerbation, um, and then, but really uh, is not. Um, in this case, I would, I would, I, I would cast doubt on the diagnosis um, of a COPD exacerbation, just because um, we didn't get any history of cough, uh, increased production, but most importantly, no wheezes on exam. Um, and, um, but the one thing I will say is with his progressive shortness of breath, I would love to ask him if like a few weeks ago or a month ago, if he had a viral illness, because something where a physical exam could be normal, but he's having progressive shortness of breath is something called um, BOOP, 
Now it's actually called uh, COP, I believe, uh, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Um, so that's one thing, but honestly, like right now, I, I don't think this is a COPD exacerbation and I would want to look for an alternative explanation um, for his uh, shortness of breath. I agree with you. I think whenever you hear somebody who's short of breath who has a history of COPD, your default assumption is to wonder whether they have a COPD exacerbation. Um, but I think that there are many other diagnoses that you can connect directly to COPD that can result in shortness of breath. And the most morbid uh, of which are the two Ps, uh, a pneumothorax or PTX and um, pulmonary embolism, PE. Um, both of them are linked with varying strength to a history of COPD, either because of a bleb rupturing or because maybe the sedentary lifestyle associated with a chronic lung disease. So I think those should probably cross your mind and you might remove the PTX based on the exam and lower the PE based on the absence of tachycardia and um, hypoxemia, but certainly should cross your mind. And I really love that central point that you're making is not everyone who is short of breath with a history of COPD as a COPD exacerbation. Um, and especially if you're getting a subacute tail, like the patient has a history of COPD and has subacute shortness of breath. None of the things we talked about so far, Jazz, COPD exacerbation, um, pulmonary embolism, and pneumothorax typically present with a subacute tail. And I'm curious, does that generate any hypothesis? You got a patient with, with COPD who has subacute shortness of breath. Any things that would cross your mind that link to COPD that, that you might um, evaluate or think about? Thoughts? Um, that links to COPD, uh, I'm not sure of if I'm being uh, completely... Yeah, yeah. Honest, but uh, I, I was thinking of like just sides of like uh, certain types of uh, atypical pneumonias um, can yeah. present in a subacute manner. He does have a slight white count, um, but it, it doesn't you know seem very convincing. Um, the other thing is, it, you know, cancer is the first thing I said uh, oh. with the with the um, you know uh, worsening dyspnea and the uh, uh, anorexia. Yeah. And patients who have COPD do have some form of smoking history as this guy, as this individual yeah. does. So I feel like that base rate disease is something I would want to rule out as lung cancer. 100%. I completely agree. I, you'd really be worried about that. Like if you hear subacute shortness of breath, you should probably consider the possibility of malignancy. And then you hear COPD, which tells you how much smoking history there is. Um, uh, I completely agree with that concern. Um, I'm curious now, what are you... Uh, what do you left? Uh, what do you think you're investigating first? Are you following the shortness of breath, or is the risk catching more of your attention now that you have all this data? I mean, uh, this patient should at least get a, a wrist X-ray and a chest X-ray. Um, so, uh, in any order, I, I, I mean, obviously, let's do get the chest X-ray first. But um, I don't think you're not scanning that wrist. Uh, it's swollen. It's red. It could be a fracture. Uh, you know, we have that. I actually missed that in the first aliquot. I didn't know that he actually fell, but um, or sprained it. Sorry. Uh, so I would say um, an X-ray for the uh, wrist, and then I would get an X-ray of the of the of the chest. But to be honest, I think this is a low threshold to get a CT because if we're concerned for anorexia and malignancy, we're getting a CT of the chest uh, to see if there's a mass or even a cavitary lesion or something else that could explain his symptoms. Oh, you're a pro. I was going to um, uh, reflect on that as well. I think that the there's an, a chest x-ray is only good for three things, meaning like good enough for three things, pneumothorax, pulmonary edema, and community acquired pneumonia. This patient does not have a pneumothorax based on exam. This patient does not have heart failure based on exam. And this patient cannot have community acquired pneumonia um, because of the, the duration of the syndrome. So remember that there are three letters in the word chest x-ray, chi, C, C, X, R. And there are three diagnoses that an x-ray is sufficiently good at. Um, pneumothorax, pulmonary edema, and, um, and community acquired pneumonia. Those are not at play here. And I completely agree with your instinct to um, get a, uh, a CT chest. Um, I'll be real with you. This patient has a cognitive impairment and I don't know how much of the history is valid here. He's saying he sprained it. I don't know. You have a white count of 13, a high CRP and a and an older patient with cognitive impairment with a swollen edematous wrist. For me, that is septic arthritis until proven otherwise. And it's usually proven otherwise. Most of these patients have trauma-induced fracture 
or trauma-induced uh, calcium, pyro, uh, 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 cal calcium pyrophosphate disease, CPBD, trauma-induced pseudogout. If I were taking care of this patient in the ER, I would get a wrist x-ray like that very quickly. And then I would be tapping the wrist because there is no emergency here. You might be sitting on pus here. Um, and when you're sitting on the possibility of pus, you have to move very quickly. Um, so I think it all comes with the relative confidence of the presence or absence of trauma. And here the confidence has to be weakened by the uh, cognitive impairment of the historian, as well as the features of inflammation you found on lab and exam. And so for me, I think x-ray is important. I wouldn't tap him without an x-ray. But if there was a delay in getting an x-ray, there is no harm in getting a wrist aspiration in somebody who, who turns out to have hemarthrosis. That will make the patient feel better if you get the blood out of there. Of course, it's not the ultimate treatment. But my advice on you, uh, to all of you is, you essentially have acute monoarticular arthritis. The possibilities are infectious, crystalline, or trauma. And I think um, that could represent a really important issue to get to the bottom of. So I would probably putting the brakes on shortness of breath right now. It's been going on for months and really make sure that there's not something bad in the breath. I'm curious what your take is on that. Um, Jess, what do you think? Uh, on, sorry, on intake on what, sorry? Do you, uh, intake on the, on the um, uh, emergency being in the wrist. Do you feel like you feel similarly or you'll probably be like, walking faster the wrist or slower what do you think i think right now he's not hypoxic um he's hemodynamically stable his lung exam was normal so honestly if i was seeing this patient i would get a chest x-ray and then a ct of the chest but i would actually be putting more cognitive energy in the wrist uh you you highlighted earlier with the dementia the history might not be completely reliable and then in, in addition to that um you know when we got that first eloquat, I just thought that was such a an interesting disconnect between the progressive shortness of breath and the right wrist swelling and pain. So I, I, right now, I feel like I would emphasize the right wrist, but not forget about the lungs either. Yeah, I love it. Very well said. All right, Yuki, what were you thinking? What did you get next? Okay, we we also got Amazing, Amazing and phosphates of electrocardiogram showed sinus tachycardia without obvious LCD change and bundle blunt block. And here's a right wrist x-ray showed no signs of fracture. Chest x-ray showed no consolidation, no cardiomegaly, and no blunting over a claustrophilic angle. And we we took uh, we took two sets of blood culture and sputum culture. And here we also added chest CT that showed uh, bilateral pulmonary emphysematous change without uh, without consultation. And we also did pulmonary function testing, which showed uh, forced uh, expiratory volume in one second was fifty two percent, indicating obstructive lung disease. And fractional exhale, exhale nitric oxide was 41 elevated. And after after several after several days, uh blood and sputum culture results showed negative. I'll stop here. What are you thinking, Dr. Bajwa? What are your thoughts? Um, so I just want to make sure I heard everything correctly. Um so Seems like the chest x-ray was basically unremarkable. Uh, CT chest showed emphysematous changes, but other than that, no mass or consolidations or cavitary lesions. And then the, um, I kind of missed the PFTs there. It seems like, uh, do you know what the ratio was? The Sorry, uh, sorry I, forgot to, I forgot that. It's okay. Oh, that's okay, Yuki. Um, so I guess where I'm, my headspace is right now is that um, this is a patient where has 
Other than emphysematous changes of the CT chest, there's no evidence of um, like a particular like honing point of where I would be concerned for, like that can explain the symptoms uh, of, of this patient. Honestly, I, I'll be honest, it, it kind of stopped me. So um, I guess the one thing I will say is that when I think of this, I think of um, a situation where could this, the diaphragm be in, in play uh, in play with the progressive shortness of breath. We didn't get any other flavor of that, no like weakness of his extremities or, or anything like that. Um, and it's been a while since I have uh, like, you know, evaluated PFTs myself. So vital capacity um, is low and the fractional exhaled um, nitroxide is high. So that, that tells me, and correct me if I'm wrong, Robbie, um, that there's a, uh, for the, the fractional exhaled nitric oxide, there's a uh, problem with the diffusion um, of, the, of the gases between the lung and the vasculature. Did I say that right, Robbie? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Um, and then uh, basically, um, I don't, without the ratio, it's hard to tell, but the FEV1 is consistent with an obstructive problem, but the vital capacity, so yeah, that's what I would say that. And, but the fractional exhaled nitric oxide, it makes me wonder, are we um, missing a vascular etiology uh, of this? I know the patient does not have a P, uh, sorry, uh, does not have tachycardia, but now I am thinking about a possible PE. Um, but I'm going to turn this over to to you, Robbie, to see if there's anything else you want to add. Yeah, no, I think that ultimately when you frame this as CT chest negative shortness of breath, I think you just have to ask what holes are left. And I think the only holes left in the evaluation of shortness of breath are to wonder if there is a uh, if there's something will show up on the CT chest with contrast, namely a pulmonary embolism or pulmonary hypertension. And that's something that will show up on the final test for shortness of breath, which is a trans uh, thoracic echo or TTE. Um, the PFTs are interesting. I think they indicate the elevated uh, uh, fractional attrition of nitrogen oxide, which is felt to be a product of eosinophils um, uh, to represent a more asthma overlap than pure COPD alone. Um, but with this patient's extensive smoking history, I think that... Um, uh, I'm not sure what value I would take of that right now, um, especially since he doesn't have signs of a significant eosinophilic disease with only 1% EOs um, on his CBC. So I think it goes to show you that right now you have, um, you're like, where do I invest my energy? And I think you have a swollen red wrist that's not broken. And so I wonder if um, the shortness of breath either represents a pulmonary vascular issue or represents uh, progression of his underlying obstructive lung disease, either COPD or COPD slash asthma overlap. Uh, I'm still nervous about his wrist. I hope it's just a sprain. And of course, um, the trajectory of the wrist, if it just got better spontaneously over time, um, that would assuage our concern. Um, but yeah, I think the shortness of breath the magnitude and severity of it, no tachypnea, no hypoxemia, and a negative workup gets you closer and closer and closer to wondering whether there's a specific diagnosis or whether you're going to render something nonspecific, like a COPD uh, progression of disease, um, like uh, um, potentially uh, recurrent silent aspirations from his Lewy body dementia. Or you might, many patients, many people in the US would even consider giving this patient some medications for a COPD exacerbation, just to see if that helps, even though the time course is fairly inconsistent with that. So if I had this patient right before me, I'm most curious about whether or not I would wanna tap the wrist. And that's what I'd be thinking about seeing if, uh, especially seeing that the, um, the evaluation for shortness of breath hasn't revealed anything emergent or life-threatening thus far. All right, Yuki, what do you have next? Okay, uh, unfortunately, we did not have enough access to arthrocentesis. So we followed up this patient as a COPD and CPPD. But uh, two months later, 
both wrists became swollen and shortness of breath worsened. Uh, just breath it, uh, oxygen saturation was 92% on room air. So we repeated the investigation. Uh, and just breath it, temperature was 97.8 Fahrenheit, heart rate 105 regular, blood pressure 109 over 66. Uh, and uh, oxygen saturation was 92% room air. And we also added a uh, laboratory exam. CBC showed white blood cell count 14K, where 72% of segmented neutrophils uh, on 0.3% of original fails. Hemolyte 25.1K, LFD showed ALST 28, ALT 40, LDH 25 for slightly elevated, ALB 58, CPK 29, albumin 2.8, and chemistry shirt, sodium 13, 8, calcium 4.1, fluoride 100, BUN 13, creatinine. 0.53, glucose 14, 6, corrected calcium 8, 8.8, .8. and CLP was 4, elevated in Japan. And we also added uh, anti nuclear antibody rheumatoid factor, CB antibodies, and alcohol at this moment. And we also dealt from the chest x-ray, which showed diffuse tracheal thickening. And the chest CT showed increased airway attenuation and diffuse tracheal collapse. And uh, and uh, several days later, um, anti-nuclear antibody, rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP antibodies, and the anchor were negative. We consulted for well this battery medicine. They did bronchoscopy, which showed bronchial, bronchial wall thickening just below blood test, TKL hemorrhage and redness present in some areas. Edematose change collinear to tracheal bronchial and peripheral bronchial. And Bronchoscopic biopsy result was inflammatory cell infiltration in the seven cruiser with no vasculitis, no atypical cells, no amyloid deposition, no acid fast bacterial infection, or no fungal infection. I will stop here. Oh my gosh, Jess, that case took quite a twist. Um... Uh, how, Many twists. How are you summer? What is what is your mental summary of the case so far? How how would you catch people up to what's going on in your mind? Oh man! All right. So to summarize, the two months uh, later, patients started developing bilateral uh, wrist swelling, and the, and then also noticed that the shortness of breath was um, uh, uh, progressing as well. With notable findings of diffuse tracheal thickening um, with tracheal collapse, um, in addition to petechial hemorrhage uh, and edematous changes found uh, found on the bronch. Um, honestly, everything that I had in my mind, uh, Yuki uh, ruled out. But I was thinking of autoimmune, specifically rheumatoid lupus, uh, and other vasculitides, um, and ANCA, ANA, RF, and CCP were negative. Then I thought about atypical infections and amyloidosis. Um, I don't see sarcoid doing this. So, uh, that has been ruled or like less likely with the bronch findings. Um, 
I guess the, to end my summary is by saying is, I think the answer is figuring out what can lead to bronchial wall thickening with petechial hemorrhage. And I think um, that would be uh, the um, answer. I think with overall, just taking a step back and seeing that now this is now four months of the syndrome going on, I, I don't think this is infectious. Uh, even atypical infections would be hard to explain. It, it's possible, but I would probably lean toward more autoimmune. And I would just say less likely for malignancy because we haven't found anything on the lungs or, you know, um, but uh, I think the money is the bronchial wall thickening. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think that um, the lesson here in understanding the cryptic shortness of breath is to realize that um, a cryptic shortness of breath, meaning CT negative shortness of breath, localizes often if there is an answer to the plumbing. And the plumbing here is twofold. The vascular system, both uh, uh, pulmonary embolism, intracardiac shunt, but also the plumbing, not that not just the plumbing that moves blood, but also the plumbing that moves air into the chest. And tracheal disorders and uh, other airways issues are notoriously tricky to diagnose. Um, and I think you you can see how a slowly progressive obstructive tracheal disease can persist for a long time and ultimately evade detection until it becomes more overt. So I think the first question to reflect on what you did was, does this map onto what we're hearing? And I think it's right. The tracheal, um, progressive tracheal thickening and stenosis, i.e. the stenosis implied by the collapse, suggests that the, the tracheal issue explains uh, the findings that we see here. So if you go back sort of through thinking systematically about what causes tracheal issues, the most common cause of tracheal thickening is trauma to the trachea, usually in the form of prior intubation or tracheostomy. Um, you can also get radiation-induced tracheal injury as sort of a non-inflammatory way. We've had... Um, uh, only a few cases of tracheal injury on VMR. So this is not a schema that I think we've deployed very frequently. But you should also know that um, there is an entity called idiopathic subglottic stenosis that occurs in usually postmenopausal women. Um, that, And the reason I think you, you should think about that here is because um, this person is on the older side and the disease seems to be centered around the trachea. But I think the value in using the wrist swelling is to tell you that this is probably a systemic disease involving the trachea, involving the um, uh, 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 the wrists. And it's not just any systemic disease. It's a systemic inflammatory disease as evidenced by the inflammation in the wrists, the inflammation in the blood with the leukocytosis and the inflammation on the biopsy. So if you take the whole world of tracheal diseases, of which idiopathic subglottic stenosis and trauma-induced tracheal diseases are probably the most common, you have to probably pretty quickly bypass them because this patient does not have a um, history of uh, intubation and does not have a disease restricted to his trachea. There's one big caveat to this entire analysis, which is the recognition that a small fraction of patients with COPD get tracheal issues. It's called a saber-toothed trachea, and it has to do with tracheal changes that develop as a result of the chronic airway hypertension that patients with COPD are under. But those patients, as far as my knowledge goes, do not have inflammatory infiltrates present on their, um, on their biopsy. So I think it is probably important for us to say, what are, what are, infiltrate, what are inflammatory diseases of the trachea? And um, there, there are not many. Um, there's a variety of immune-mediated tracheal diseases, infection-mediated tracheal diseases, um, and amyloid, which Yuki told us is not at play, is a really important one to think about. Um, 
of course, if you know, if you have to like ask yourself what kinds of infections cause tracheal issues, you probably be not thinking about that all day, every day. Um, but so there is a short list, but for practical purposes, I think the one to really, really recognize is TB tracheitis. It is the most infectious form of TB. Um, and you'd have to think about that, recognizing that Japan has a high, high rate of tuberculosis. So I think I would be really, really worried about the possibility of TB tracheitis in this patient because of a subacute wasting syndrome, and also to recognize that TB can also go to the wrists. Um, the autoimmune diseases that are at play here, Jazz, there are many of them. Um, I'm curious if you have any reflex associations with autoimmune disease and tracheal issues, and um, would love to pass the mic to you to reflect on that, but holding our breath to make sure it's not TB. But let's venture and think about what autoimmune diseases might cross your mind. Yeah. Um, so I, I was going to ask, like, you know, I was going to ask you, like, I find it curious that the wrists and then the trachea both can have, especially depending where the inflammation in the wrist could be, is cartilage. Um, and, you know, could that be the underlying connecting factor here? And if that's the case, you know, um, you know, uh, relapsing polychondritis comes to mind. However, the epidemiology and the time, the age of onset doesn't fit. There's no facial symptoms. Um, like the ear, uh, the, uh, I believe both ears can be involved. I mean, you know, diseases can present in different ways for sure. So, uh, but you, you, to answer your question directly is when I think of the trachea being involved, um, I think this is a, a great example of where I would get, go to the radiologist and say, hey, that diffuse tracheal collapse, is it consistent with like a diffuse um, bronchial uh, or uh, tracheal malaysia? Because that's my main association when it comes to relapsing polychondritis. Um, the radiologists, they hopefully uh, are, are aware of the differences between relapse and polychondritis versus other reasons of bronchial malaysia uh, or tracheal malaysia, sorry. Um, but I'm trying to connect the wrists and then the trachea. And I know that both have cartilage involved in them. And could that be the um, underlying thing? And that's why I said in the earlier aliquot, could this be an autoimmune condition? Uh, it doesn't have to be relapsing polychondritis. I also agree that I, I also think that infiltrative is another possibility. Amyloid that seems less likely. Um, it just doesn't seem, I, I mean, you think of joints and lung involvements, you think of sarcoid, but I don't see uh, granulomas. I don't see, and plus ages, a little bit on that, I would have expected her to have some other forms of um, granulomatous uh, identification by now. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I can make some progress by saying that there might be a clue between the wrist cartilage, if that is in fact involved, and then the bronchial wall thickening as the underlying connecting uh, feature here. Yeah, I suspect I agree with you. I don't think anybody can pull out a diagnosis. And I think we're still, despite it, in, in problem-solving mode. And I just, I would love for all of you to sit there and realize just how much progress you've made. You've had months of subacute progressive shortness of breath, and now you know there is tracheitis as the explanation for that. And initially, we were hemming and hawing about the value of the wrist, and is it a sprain or not? And now you have bilateral wrist inflammation. So you're trying to solve a very specific problem, which is tracheitis with bilateral wrist arthritis. And I think that um, it's very, very hard to know what the answer is, but I think that the most morbid possibility is tuberculosis, and that has to be evaluated very, very thoroughly. And I think um, the next step would probably be to understand the risks better in some way, shape, or form, recognizing that, yes, there are some very few autoimmune diseases that can, that can involve the trachea. Relapsing polychondritis is the chief one. GPA can do it. Sarcoid can do it. And importantly, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, especially UC, which this patient doesn't seem to have. Um, so um, I think we're in the world of infection priority, but autoimmune disease is a possibility. And notably, while we commonly say that autoimmune diseases are unlikely in older adults, um, relapsing polychondritis is fair game in an older adult, as is GPA. So um, honestly, if I had to have a prioritized DDX, it would be um, uh, it would be TB, 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 TB. And to think about our, our relapsing parachondritis and GPA despite the negative uh, income.
But either way, we've, we're going to get a lot of learning because I think this is maybe just the second case of tracheitis we've ever had on TM1. So we'll pass the mic to Yuki to tell us more. Okay, uh, at this moment, uh, we also have the same differentials. And at this moment, we retrospectively not just a California deformity of years and the southern north in the coastal investigation. So we had the allocular cartilage biopsy, which showed replacement sites with fibrous tissue, indicating a degenerative of cartilage tissue with the allocal. So based on all these findings, including California years, allocular chondritis, Saturner's deformity, nasal chondritis, tracheal chondritis, cell negative breast arthritis, and the biopsy finding, the diagnosis of relapsing polychondritis was made. Subsequent cardiac echo shows no severe vulvar diseases, and consultation with ophthalmology revealed no signs of vitis. But yeah, this case was yeah so difficult, but yeah, educating for me as well. Yeah, I think you presented it like you made it the most challenging case under the sun. <laughs> so well presented, and re reveal at the end was really really telling. Thank you so much. I'm curious, Jas, what are you thinking? What are your thoughts? This is why I never liked cauliflower. Uh, so, so yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I think that just gives you, um, I, I feel reassured that like the, you know, that even though, you know, um, there was, you know, I wasn't like, yes, this is textbook relapsing polychondritis. I was able to say that the underlying connecting feature here could be the cartilage being attacked here. So, um, it just shows how humbling medicine is. And like the fact that, um, that even in the, I believe the epidemiology behind RP is younger onset. Um, so I feel like that, that to keep that, that in mind that this could have been going on for years um, or a late uh, atypical presentation of RP. Um, but Yuki, I think I echo what uh, Robbie said that um, you presented it in such a challenging way, which really stretched uh, um, my cognitive ability, probably not so much Robbie's, but uh, this was an excellent case and I learned a lot. Yeah, you know, I think my, um, I, I acknowledge that like my cognitive ability was not stretched, not because I knew the diagnosis, but it was because I'm trying to impart this idea more and more and more that this is not about what the answer is. This is all about like trying to understand the problem better. And, um, and once you're trying to understand the problem better, something beautiful happens where you immediately realize, wait, hold on, I have a tracheal problem and a wrist problem. What connects the two? Cartilage. Oh, let me look that up. And I think all too often medical school and residency teaches you to be like, oh, what's the answer? My attending will be disappointed if I don't know the answer or my uh, intern will, will think I'm not smart um, when I'm leading them because I don't know the answer. No, it's not about the answer. It's all about knowing what the problem is. And once you understand the problem, the answer should be effortless as it was for you. Solving this case before you could represent the problem accurately was the hardest task. And if you choose to actively do that hard task, you're going to suffer miserably. But if you sit back and realize that actually that task is not what the real job is, the real job is to understand the problem better. You can casually sit back, have some tea and wait for the problem to come become more clear. And then it becomes really easy, honestly, as you showed, you literally proved this point right now. Um, and for me, this case just really comes down to um, the, the not ignoring the wrist and not taking, oh, I sprained it at face value. And I think that when you hear that the patient has dementia, you might also, as I failed to do, but probably will learn from this case, to not anchor on the fact that he didn't have prior ear or nose episodes. He may not have the kind of ability to tell you that and to look more diligently for their presence, which was really cool. But a big, big point I want to show you all visually. This schema is not exactly saying this, but you look at CT chest negative shortness of breath slash hypoxemia, always think ventilation issues or vascular issues. 
And I think that if we were primed to think ventilation or vascular, we might have looked back and asked the radiologist, hey, can you please look at that original CT? Do you see anything in the trachea at all? Why am I asking you, radiologist? Because I have CT negative shortness of breath, and I want to make sure that there are no ventilation or vascular issues. And you might then have seen, without having to wait two months, seen, oh, maybe there's something there. So I think that's the biggest, those are the two biggest things that could have helped us in this case earlier. Don't ignore wrist swelling ever. Um, and uh, image negative dyspnea, think ventilation or vascular. Those are my two pieces of advice. Um, but I think it was really cool to see you be like, hey, cartilage is the common denominator here. And once the problem was clear, I think it was a really good question to ask. Any other reflections, Jas, before we ask Yuki to share hers? No, I think this was a great case. And um, thank you, Yuki, for bringing it. And just shout out to uh, Mariana. And, and um, who was quagging today? Um, you always see Shema's name there because she's uh, um, polishing the scrubbing all the time. But she in conjunction with Shreyas at four in the morning uh, in India. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, Shreyas and Mariana, great job on the whiteboard. Yuki, what, what was it like to take care of this patient and to experience this in real life? Um, we sent this patient to another. Uh, actually, this is a really challenging case. And uh, we sent this patient to a uh, specialization hospital. So, but we took you know, several several months to diagnose. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked up at uh, Alpi. They said yeah, it takes a long time to uh to get a diagnosis. So we we thought we all had the same how do I say pitfall, I think. So just as a yeah, really challenging case. But uh, Dr. Jess Dave, really amazing discussion. Thank you so much. Yuki, I am uh... I, I can't thank you enough. You always bring just the most incredible educational cases for us. And the way you structure them makes them such rich educational journeys. Really, really thank you. Um, I don't do this very often, but a, a friend and colleague of mine just made a really, really good point in the chat. I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure, Michael, if you're able to unmute and share what you were thinking. I, it's a really, really potentially a management changing uh, question that uh, Michael was sharing. I, I don't know if you can unmute, but if you can, please do. If not, I can, yeah. Hey, yeah. hello, and, uh, hello, hello. Uh, yeah, fantastic case. Um, and uh, I was just uh, wondering if, um, if potentially we should be thinking also about whether or not this gentleman could have uh, vexus, uh, and you could do uh, further genetic testing for this, just particularly given his age. Um, and then you know, there's certain disorders we think of, uh, particularly in older men, including. Um, polyarteritis nodosa, sweet syndrome, you know, if those, uh, if we were to see those diagnoses and one other potential clue would be if, if they had a macrocytosis, um, then we could do the genetic testing for, for vexus, which was just a newly discovered disorder and we're, we're realizing is uh, perhaps more, more prevalent than we previously thought. So just curious about whether or not that could be pursued as a next diagnostic step. For those of you who don't know, uh, uh, Dr. Camarada is a graduate of UCSF and a current, currently a, a rheumatology fellow at Johns Hopkins. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's a very wise point. Uh, whenever you have uh, RP or uh, other uh, diseases in an unusual demographic, I think thinking about vexus is a very wise idea. Yuki, do you remember what the MCV was for your patient? Or if you don't have that data, we, you can email us later and we can reflect. Okay, uh, I'm not sure about here. The MCV was around one or something. Wow. I'll send it later. Yeah, I think uh, Michael's point is really important because if his MCV is high, you might consider a very interesting diagnosis called Vexus, V-E-X-A-S. And it would change how you treat this patient dramatically. And I'm sure Michael can speak to it a lot more than I can, but with a really, really cool pickup, uh, Michael. It's really cool. Um, all righty, we're a little over time. Um, so I'll pass the mic to uh, Mariana to 
uh, round out the teaching point. Thank you so much Eva, for this amazing case and thank you Rabbi and Jess for the um, fantastic discussion. And I just want to say that uh, I did the teaching points for the Mark, uh, for the case that Mark presented a couple of months ago. Uh, it was regarding the uh, relapsing polychondritis. So whenever we started to discuss like um, tracheal uh, issues, I remember that and it was so nice like to be uh, uh, in this space again, doing the same thing and learning more about relapsing polychondritis. So let's go ahead with the teaching points. Um, we started with a patient with progressive SOB and raised redness and swelling. And in a learning space uh, like this one, we can dislocate every symptom, but in a pre uh, if we're like in a more distant apartment, we would need a practical thinking and we would have to think how bad this patient is and uh, which of the symptoms we should manage right away. So we should uh, look at the patient, if it has any signs of hypoxemia, and also uh, to, to discuss SOB, uh, we have to, to know if the SOB appears on exertion or uh, during rest, and rest would be more concerning, but this patient is uh, appearing with, with SOB for uh, two months, so it's subacute, it gives us more time to think about what is happening with this patient. And he also appeared with anorexia. It could be secondary to COPD or heart failure, heart failure, or uh, but malignancy also uh, couldn't be ruled out at this point. And we started to discuss about the uh, risk, wetness, and swelling. And we um, discussed if it was a signal or or, or a noise, and it ended up being a a, a, a signal. So we, we uh, had to consider that to our diagnosis, and. Uh, uh, to assess the, the risk, redness, and swelling, it's really important uh, for our observational uh, skills um, for our physical exam. So we could uh, try to find out signs of fracture or septic arthritis, and then reveal uh, really quickly the MSK issues and we have to think about skin, subcutaneous tissues, ligaments, bursa, tendons, and try to differentiate arthropathy and arthritis. And uh, a really important point that I learned today, we should not be attached to um, um, acute exacerbation uh, of COPD in patients with past medical history of COPD. We have to consider differentials for these patients, such as uh, pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, cryptogenic, organizing pneumonia and malignance. We have to ask about triggers, and, but in this case, the lack of wheezes uh, on our exam, and also we had an inconsistent time course, so it would be less likely. And we also learned that uh, the CXR are really important for uh, CAP, pneumothorax, and pulmonary edema, but it can be not useful for uh, other conditions. And uh, whenever you have monoarticular arthritis, think about infections, crystalline or trauma. And in this patient, we could have CPPD or septic arthritis. And then uh, with more data, we found out that this patient had a uh, low VC and low FEV1. Uh, it could be COPD progression, aspiration, COPD exacerbation. Uh, we, this patient also had a, an elevated fractional exhalant and no uh, it's a sign of endo endogenous inflammation. And then with more data, uh, uh, the patient had uh, progressive tracheal stenosis. This when we uh, started to broaden our diagnosis a little bit and we discussed it, uh, tuberculosis, autoimmune diseases, relapsing polychondritis, GPA, infiltrative diseases uh, such as amyloid and sarcoidosis, and uh, IBD. And that's what I have for today. Thank you so okay. much. You're a tracheal expert, Mariana, a tracheal expert. It's amazing. Nothing will sneak by you. That was a masterclass. But also really like that you didn't uh, forget the simple things like just, you know, the, that you made all the cool esoteric learning points, but you reminded us of the basics that we went along the way. That was really, really cool. Thank you. Thanks, Yas. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Yuki, for another amazing case. Really, really learned a lot. And we hope um, to see you all of you for a, uh, uh, a um, different formulation of student VMR. You should check out your emails. Um, you'll see something either currently or in the future. Thank
thank you to JAS and the VMR leadership team for making that happen and hope to see many of you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you so much.